Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We're gardening undercover with our first virtual gardening series for 2024. My name is Darby Love and I am the adult services uh, librarian at Nanaimo North Branch. My colleague April, she is in Souk and she is doing all the back end stuff to make sure everything goes smoothly technically. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Stananas and Stanema First Nations. And I saw a bunch of people put their territorial um, acknowledgement in there too. You can if you'd like to. We really want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Master Gardeners uh, for partnering with Burl on the program. And a special thanks to Joanne, who's presenting today. Canning for her key role in creating this program. It's been really successful. It's so exciting to be part of it and be creating a whole back um, archive of sessions on topics that you can go back and look at fire smart gardening or container gardening or whatever else you're interested in. And Richard Bernier, who is in the jungle there, um, I see maybe a Hoya in there, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and he's our, our um, liaison between and coordinator for the program and has been for the last few years. So it's been great working with Richard too. Housekeeping items. We are recording the session today and nobody's faces or anything or any personal information will be captured in the session. Um, that's how I didn't know you were here when April had let 75 of you in. And please uh, continue to make use of the chat feature with your um, comments. Um, we can also have, you can put questions there throughout that Jean and Richard will uh, tackle, but if you want um, Joanne, Joe, you prefer Joe, to answer question after her presentation, we would like you to preferably put it in the Q&A, which is on my screen, it's on the bottom, um, and that way we can sort of manage and keep track of your questions much more effectively and not miss anything. That would be great. Okay. Um, yeah, so Joe's going to talk for about an hour and and then we're going to answer um, a bunch of your questions. So I'm going to introduce Joe, Senior Master Gardener, Joanne Canning, teaches and writes about sustainable gardening and food security in our changing climate. She is an ornamental plant enthusiast and was a year-round urban food gardener for over 35 years. She's taught seminars at Van Dusen Garden, horticultural associations and garden clubs, VIU's master gardener training classes, and the horticultural technicians program at VIU's Payne Center. Her articles and photographs have appeared in Canadian, American, and international magazines. Without further ado, over to Joe. Thank you and welcome. Uh, a brief aside for um, all you wonderful people that have come from not Canada. Um, you'll notice that uh, some people were signing in with um, places they were from that look very odd, and that's because they're um, signing in from the traditional Aboriginal territory and using that alphabet and that spelling. And it's uh, it's just part of what Canada is doing right now uh, in terms of the Truth and Reconciliation Program. Uh, so in case you were um, curious, that's why. So let's begin. Um, I just, uh, just, sorry, Joe, one new yes. accessibility thing that we have starting today ah. is captions. So if you didn't hear me before, you can show or hide captions along your control panel. Thanks. Okay, and here we are. And I'm just uh, getting all my little buttons straight here. There we go. And uh, welcome to Gardening Undercover. Uh, that's me, the presenter. 
and uh, we are doing this in association with the Vancouver uh, Regional Library. Uh, we could not do it without them. And uh, that's that. A brief introduction. Um, we are a chapter of the Master Gardeners Association of British Columbia, a registered not-for-profit society. And we are part of an international organization of specially trained volunteers, teachers, and consultants who work in partnership with public agencies, private enterprise, uh, to promote science-based and sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. And in fact, the Master Gardeners was started in Washington State um, in the 70s, and it has spread around the world. And every state uh, in the US, every province in Canada, and several districts in the UK, and also in Australia um, are now represented. Um, this uh, seminar is property of the uh, of the Vancouver Island Regional Library um, and standard stuff with the copyright and cha cha cha. Um, and uh, the images that you see um, are all um, acknowledged or from public sources. And um, uh, a big shout out to all the artists and companies and nonprofits that um, allowed us to shoot uh, or to display their images for this educational uh, program. So we have seasonal problems in the garden. And um, before we begin to talk about the problems, uh, I want to um, have you look at some of your handouts. Now I put all these handouts, I sent all these handouts to you uh, so you don't have to take notes. All you have to do is listen and enjoy. It's all technical data. It's something that you can refer to later on. And I'm gonna jump forward in time just for a moment to give a quick message to all you folks in the future who are gonna be watching the recording of the seminars. All the handouts in the lists are on the slides. And so if you want that particular information, just access it by uh, clicking print screen and you can download that. So uh, you're welcome in advance. Now, many of the people here, I'm sure, um, have a lot of the, in, uh, the information already that we're gonna discuss. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of starting a bit from scratch uh, both to help you review, but also to maybe fill in some holes. So my focus is going to give you really more tools, whether you're just a beginning gardener or an advanced gardener, and to help you have better control over your garden environments. Uh, we're going to look at judging the landscape. So we're going to get a bit of theory. We're going, and then we'll move on to the different types of covers you can use for different reasons. And um, as you see from the handouts, um, what materials are available. I wasn't gonna put this in, but when I was doing my, my brush up and, and research, I realized that it's pretty, it can be pretty confusing. And this will help you make choices that are less costly and more effective. So a lot of the problems that many of us are seeing and particularly here in the Northwest, um, are relatively new problems. When you look at climates, any zone, any growing zone that's on the edge of a climate sees more change um, on the shoulder seasons than those that are in the middle of the climate. You folks on the East Coast are seeing a major shift uh, for instance, the hurricane season is longer and earlier and more violent, whereas on the West Coast, we're not getting more violent. We're just getting things like um, very early January thaws and then very late summer freezes. So in the forest, um, you've already got bud break and then everything freezes. One of the things, uh, if you have moved around, is... Um, one of the easiest learning techniques um, you already know because you learn from the neighbors in the climate next to you. A lot of folks uh, in Canada 
come to the West Coast because they retire here and it's warmer. It's like, it's, it's Canada's Florida. Uh, and so they have these uh, techniques um, because you have to use them all the time. If you live in the mountains, you, you're always looking at covering the crops, uh, your salad crops um, against a, a, a late frost. So you'll find there's uh, quite a bit of uh, familiarity. Um, so we use covers to solve problems. So first of all, of course, we have to identify um, these seasonal problems. And it's uh, fairly easy. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too wet, it's too dry, it's too windy, it's too bright, it's too shady, it's too changeable, and there are way too many pests. Um, so, oh, wait a minute, gotta go to the next page. So how does uh, covering um, help us? It mitigates all these extremes. And some of you will be looking at this list and saying, well, that pretty much describes a year where I live. And uh, that's okay. So how does covering plants help? And these two um, examples, the top one is Australia. And you see this 10% um, cover, which is on all the time. And then you see these small covers. Uh, the one below is kind of fun, this guy here. Um, it uh, is in the Northeast of the US and it is called um, winter sowing. So these are all mini greenhouses, which are really, as you can see, um, leftover and used um, storage uh, containers. And uh, you can look this up just under winter sowing. And in the fall, you plant all your extra seeds and you put them out. Uh, the only thing is you have to be careful they don't get drowned. And you can see they'll sit like this. And the neat thing about it is that it uh, allows the seeds to make their own decision. And plants will usually make their decision much faster than we will. Uh, and they know exactly when to sprout and they get an earlier start. Seeds are quite hardy and uh, they will grow and sometimes stop and hold and grow again. And um, it makes a very positive difference. So um, how, how it helps us is it prevents winter uh, damage. It predict, predicts, uh, protects against summer extremes, as you can see in this uh, uh, top picture. Another very important thing is that it excludes pets and disease. And in some areas, you have uh, certain types of, of pests and disease that um, are a perennial problem. For instance, uh, here in the Northwest, you have to grow your carrots under cover because carrot rust fly uh, is a real problem everywhere. The other important thing, and I've just mentioned it, about um, the winter sowing is that it extends the growing season. And again, if you go to a uh, Western gardening and look at your shoulder seasons, uh, you will see uh, how important that can be. And a lot of people feel uh, that, oh, well, covering crops is only what vegetable growers do. Um, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's, actually not the case, um, that um, lots of people cover crops for very particular reasons. And um, although it's uh, very much um, known that vegetable gardeners are um, pretty manic about this because uh, you wanna be able to eat, um, many ornamental gardeners are growing things on the edges of their climate and 
want to now that the climates are shifting, protect their wonderful children. And I, this is being stubborn. So just remember though, that um, every time you change an environment, you're also gonna create problems. Um, the more we cover, the more we're creating an artificial environment, even though we're shifting it to a warmer environment that might in our summer be um, normal. If you're covering for extending your growing season, it is artificial. And when you do that, you have to work more to get the same results. So um, it creates its own problems. Uh, the idea is to get as much as you want um, with as little work. Um, but always remember, each change creates its own issues. So this is the problems with covered gardening. Uh, I am not getting a response, uh, Darby. Hang on, I'm going to see... what I can do here. There we go. So here are our problems. You can see it interferes with pollination. Well, if you're covering your fruit trees, um, you're, uh, you're not, you're not going to get fruit. It also excludes beneficials. Often we forget that um, we're so focused on the pests that 80% of all the bugs you will see as well as the bats and the birds and the uh, rove beetles um, are beneficial and that they do a lot of our work. But if you're covering your garden all the time, they can't do the work and you have to. One of the major problems with covering crops is that it lowers air circulation. So you open up things to disease like powdery mildew or root rot, and you're more susceptible to pest e epidemics because you've excluded the beneficials. So most people use covering seasonally uh, or for very particular reasons. Um, the other problem is that it can need special soil. Uh, uh, Richard, who... Um, uh, grows many or indoor plants um, is quite aware of that uh, because his wonderful tropicals take special soil. I used to grow succulents and so I had to create special soils for that. Uh, I now grow bonsai and I have to create special soils for that. Those are all things that happen because we're gardening undercover. And of course, if you're building anything, there's extra costs and extra labors and all like that. So the first thing we really need to do is a uh, plan. And if you take a bit of time and plan, you will be surprised how much more success you will have. And I'll tell you a quick story about myself. Uh, I moved into a place, I decided I wanted a greenhouse. And of course, I could see everything around me. I knew what it needed. It was no problem. And then I thought, hmm, um, maybe I'll wait just a little bit and not dig up the ground this autumn. And wouldn't you know, um, I was completely wrong in my judgment because I took the time and I tracked my sun uh, patterns, um, I did ended up doing something completely different. So if old people like me that have been doing it for a while can learn, I'm sure everyone can. Take a bit of time. Uh, let yourself be successful. Are you gonna grow food crops? Do you have a woodland and you're really most interested in trees? Uh, do you like flowers? Is it perennials you want? Um, are you a container gardener and annuals are your bag? Are you growing tropica tropicals or succulents? Or do, or do you really want to make a bog garden? 
or pond plants. I included this little picture in the bottom here. This is a bog garden in a container and all those plants are carnivores. Now that's esoteric. And of course the, the above one is a, a gardening magazine. So once you've decided on your goals, take a look at your landscape. Find out where the wind's coming from. I used to grow about 400 square feet of vegetables. And uh, one winter, uh, winter, we had a lot of wind. And one whole side of the bed was freezing uh, because I wasn't ready with a cover to stop that wind. I lost a lot of vegetables. What are your water sources and channels? Um, that can um, really be a problem if you decide to put a greenhouse in and you've got a little seeper spring in there. Uh, so understand that. The sun and shade patterns are probably the single most important thing you need to learn. And we'll deal with that in a, in a bit in a slide. This picture to the left is one that I took um, in 2018 in the Stout Grove um, Sequoia stand in Southern Oregon. And you'll see that it's what we call a sun window. And it's quite natural. Uh, this is about three o'clock in the afternoon uh, in September. And for many people with shady yards, if you know your sun and shade patterns, you can put sun where you want even if you're surrounded by trees, by simply shinnying up the tree and cutting out a branch. And I have done that in, uh, uh, I did that in a yard uh, where I was surrounded by big Douglas firs and I had a huge shady spot. And mind you, I was still young and tough and I could shinny up trees then. And I saw where my sun pattern was and I cut out some branches and I got sun at 9.30 in the morning on the bed that I wanted it. So once we get that, we will know what locations we actually have that are available for creating cover. I, uh, on that, that same uh, uh, yard that I spoke of with the seeper, I figured that I would um, have my little greenhouse in a particular place. And uh, I waited on through winter and I saw that actually there was a whole section of my yard because of some trees. I never got sun at all, never from the middle of December to the end of January, which meant if I put my uh, cover there, uh, about 20% of my greenhouse would be pretty much wasted as winter gardening because I had no light. And light is the most important limiter of growth in plants, not temperature. Temperature is important, but light is most important. So once that you get all that together, you will um, discover the areas that are gonna serve the goals, that's gonna match up your landscape and your plants. Now I'm gonna give you a, a, a spoiler alert here. Um, there are two very deadly destroyers of garden. One is ambition and the second is impatient. So if, have patience, do not be ambitious. Let the plants and let the landscape features, the natural features, the sun and shade, what kind of water you're getting. Let them teach you. And if you do that, um, you will get much better. Um, the two most important things to learn, once you've learned about the two most deadly destroyers, uh, well, actually there's three. First of all, you'll never get it all right. Second of all, you'll never get it all done. But third of all, you have the rest of your life to play with it. So if you think about your garden and you're gonna walk around your garden, take a notebook and do a walk about now in whatever season you find yourself. 
and then repeat when the season changes and take some time to plan. Because here we are with our solar window, our sun and shade patterns. And uh, the bottom part is the most important thing. Go out, and if you've got kids, this is more fun. Uh, because the uh, moon rises just at dusk and sets just after dawn. And this is where the sun is going to be in six months. So here we are. Uh, and in winter, you will find out what's happening in summer. And so December is May and June is December. Now this, uh, you can plot your sun window, which is really fun. Uh, and this link is in your pages. So now that we kind of have all that under our belt, um, we can go on, uh, I'm just going through my handouts here because I get ahead of myself, uh, going on to the types of covers. They have different purposes, they have different styles, uh, and they're made of different materials. We have temporary, seasonal. We have permanent structures with changing or temporary covers. Oh, and there's our bug. And we have permanent greenhouses, and then we have multi-use, which are really quite fun. So let's start with temporary covers. Now, if I can get this to work, it'll be rather cool. There we go. So here we have what a lot of us uh, are, are used to seeing, particularly if you're vegetable gardeners. They're just uncovering um, their spring bed. Here is... Uh, obviously, bamboo cloches, and that's to keep uh, birds off, small uh, small bushes and flowers and berries. Over here, this is Arizona, and you see their cover is their sunshade here and uh, a permanent uh, sunshade here. Um, this um, writer said that their shade cover, uh, they keep up from May to October and they're growing peas and tomatoes. But without that sage sh uh, uh, shade cover, they wouldn't be able to do that. Let's see if I can get rid of this now. Whoa, screwed that one up. Okay, let's try that again. There we go. And of course, this uh, the standard milk jug uh, 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 cloches. And this one is kind of neat, and I've got the link in the um, uh, in the handouts because it's a different way of dealing with um, uh, uh, a cover is that it slides along these line, these uh, two um, lines right here, see? And then he pushes it back. Whereas we're, um, the traditional way is on the one below where you have your hoops and then you pull your remake over it. Now, here are the covers. You have this on your handouts. And uh, give it a quick read if you haven't already. Um, one of the important ones to really look at is the Rime, um, uh, which is row cover. Rime is, is a brand name, kind of like Kleenex, you know, um, because it, um, it really is quite um, multi-use because it's a 30% shade cloth, which is pretty much a standard uh, cloth. Underneath there, um, you will see what 30% shade does in terms of insulating plants. Um, this is a very uh, important one for um, those of us in um, the Pacific Northwest um, or in generally mild climates like uh, 7A, uh, through 9b, um, because often it's all you need. Here is another uh, another group. Uh, uh, the greenhouse cloth, we'll talk a bit about that as well. 
uh, and uh, Sun Tuff panels are um, are PVC and they're clear. Uh, that again is a brand name, uh, and you'll see that all over North America. And uh, that um, I have also used, and it's a very effective um, roofing material. And Solex panels, uh, oops, sorry, Solex panels are um, translucent and they're extruded PVC. So they look like white corrugated uh, cardboard. They too are very useful. And I um, used them uh, quite a bit uh, in the past. So now let's look at our second group, which is permanent structures that have changeable cover or permanent structures that can be moved. So you're not taking them all apart. Um, this crop cage from Walmart um, also is available in the States, um, very much used in England uh, because it's more settled. There's more bugs, more people, um, more critters. And I think probably in the Southern uh, US, um, that's also more the case. Um, we're a little bit wilder up here. This mini greenhouse is, I found a very, very useful cover. I, uh, one year, um, and I used mine for, they lasted for five years without a problem. And then we moved and I passed them on to someone else. I had three of these. I tied them onto a fence so the wind wouldn't blow them over. And then the low part here uh, on this side um, was where the wind hit. And I put those um, Solex panels and then put a panel on the cement. And in winter, I simply took out my seedling uh, pad, my seedling uh, pads, mats, and put them on top of the wire, and that was 70 degrees, and I kept my uh, wonderful um, chili arbol, um, chili uh, peppers are perennial, and I had a little tree pepper, and she was very happy out there uh, where she got enough sun and stayed warm. Uh, here is uh, from Lee Valley, again, um, an American and a Canadian company. And it is a double walled, movable um, Dutch light, um, uh, which is, um, oh, and of course the name is gone, but anyway. Um, so uh, it has, has a good function and it is a movable one. Down here from Gravity Garden in the UK, you see the more traditional permanent ones. And they did something wonderful here because they painted the black on the outside to pull the heat in and to hold the heat. And they painted it white on the inside to reflect um, the light. You'll see at the back here, um, uh, one with the glass down with the cover. Um, this is just a movable one that you can uh, buy. And you've got the, the Garden Illustrated um, uh, link. Uh, and notice that it has a, um, a channel to allow air circulation. Remember what I said. Um, this guy uh, has a wonderful design for a flip up uh, cover. And of course, uh, this is just obviously to keep out critters, but then it's reusable because in winter you can put um, a cover over that. And if you're growing roses in an area where they might freeze or even um, in zone seven, zone seven, if you're growing upright rosemary, you can lose that as well. So by putting a cage over it and then covering it, uh, you can save that um, that plant. Now, this is a special uh, situation, and that is balconies and decks, which many of us um, 
live on. And I, I bring it up because um, there are some special things about it. First of all, you uh, take a look at this cross piece here. Um, they can't put anything into the wall, so they've created a separate uh, structure to hang things on. They're also using one crop to cover another crop. And then uh, if they need to, they can drape something across the top. So here you need to take extra care to know your sun and shade pattern because it changes quite suddenly in what is a very small space. Remember to go vertical for growth to get your light. And then we just talked about the, the, the trellises. And you will often need two different uh, covers uh, on one balcony that we had. That's what we had. We had a shade cloth for summer and then a protective winter cover. And this is something as well to remember that if you have a strata and you want to grow plants, um, check with them because they will often have rules on weight and uh, you need to install protection for your decking. It's pretty costly if you uh, make a, a dent or a tear in your decking and it can cost you three, $4,000. So you can get lovely modular uh, plastic matting with drain holes in it um, that um, is, is uh, a very good and often better than plant trays with wheels because those wheels can also dent the decking. And always install effective drainage. Now, the easiest one that I found was, uh, as you see, a hose through the bottom of a container that goes to the ground. Um, say you have uh, these containers up here. Where's my? These, these containers up here, you can, when you water them, you can put your hose uh, down and into a bucket and let it drain that way. And then you don't have to uh, lift them off their, their hooks and then simply empty your bucket or reuse it for the next time. So now we go to even more uh, artificial environment. Greenhouses are totally separate and are quite fascinating in many ways. Always remember, the further you away, you are away from the natural environment, the more management you need or the more construction you need to create what you want. So um, whenever we can get the outside environment to help us in any season, um, we're gonna have more solar gain, we're gonna have natural air circulation and we're gonna have rainwater capture. Here you'll see in um, this one, Oh, where'd you go? No, don't do that, my dear. Um, there we go. Here, and it did it again. I can see that I'm not having much success. There we go. This guy here, you can see the snow. Um, I had an acquaintance who had a greenhouse in Quebec. So we're talking like upstate New York here. And uh, they very diligently piled all the snow as high as they could along the uh, sides of their greenhouse because it was available insulation and it kept their greenhouse um, several degrees warmer. Remember, if you're putting a greenhouse and you want to use a greenhouse in an area that freezes, you have to get it covered before the ground freezes. I know that seems very, well, duh, yeah. I have forgotten to do it, so I'm just reminding. Now here's from Rhode Island, and I thought it was very charming what they did. They put their greenhouse at their, at their back door. So they created this lovely, lovely porch environment with lots of sun and uh, plants as well. This one I just fell in love with um, because it's, it's made from old window panes. And often um, window panes are used in um, a cold, uh, um, um, cold frames, Dutch lights. 
uh, very handy. Uh, now here is uh, something that you can buy at Home Depot. It just leans up against the side of the house. One thing you need to remember is that you're creating moisture against the side of your house. So either make sure that that area is already impermeable, like plaster, and it's going to grow mold, or create an airspace behind it in here and put a wall and put a wall up there. Now, this is really a very fascinating type of greenhouse, and it's a sunken greenhouse, and we'll deal with that in a bit. Um, and we, I have several links for wallapinis. I lived in the Southwest in New Mexico, and um, they were quite, quite amazing. Uh, in the North, it takes on a completely different shape because of the, the angle of our sun. So there are some uh, examples of the type of uh, greenhouses that you can have. Really, the sky's the limit. And I particularly liked the recycled products. Um, they may not be quite as fashionable looking. Um, I find them charming and I love to reuse stuff. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. This is being very balky for some reason. There we go. So here are the comparisons again from the cold frames, uh, cool, the cold greenhouse, the cool greenhouse and the warm greenhouse. The one thing that is uh, interesting to note here is the uh, difference, the difference between the Dutch lights or the cold frames and the cold greenhouse. Uh, I was reading um, something, did I write it down? And basically it said, the nice thing about a cold frame is that it does everything that a cold greenhouse does. In other words, an unheated greenhouse, uh, except that it doesn't take up as much space and is cheaper to build. Now, cold greenhouses can be very, very valuable in um, extending your growing season. They're not going to be nearly as effective in a colder climate. But then, you know, some people, they're very happy in September, October uh, to shut everything down and the cold greenhouse becomes their storage area and they might use it more in summer. So to um, if you're using a greenhouse, you usually move up um, at least one zone. And that can be useful uh, if you want to grow more tomatoes and, and more uh, uh, eggplant and things like that. Um, also in areas that get a lot of rain, uh, a cold greenhouse, particularly if it has good air circulation, um, allows you to grow things like tomatoes without getting um, early blight or late blight because it is um, resident in the native soil. And when the rain hits the ground, it splashes up the bacteria and hits the leaves. So uh, by keeping it undercover, you get a, there are years where you just lose your crop. That's all there's to it. So um, the other thing to note is in the warm greenhouse, think month of May and it's, absolutely fascinating to me that everywhere in the northern hemisphere just about um the month of may is about the same everywhere it's quite wonderful um so uh that's why i put in um the month of may now this information i took from a book by elliot coleman who um now uh, chelsea green is in vermont he's in maine and it's called the winter harvest handbook if you really want to understand in depth about gardening undercover, read this book. This is his first book on the subject. Uh, and what's valuable about it over some other books is that he takes you through his learning process. And that taught me so much more. Now, of course, eco-friendly stuff is pretty important if you're like me, like most gardeners. Um, and here are the six most 
uh, eco-friendly and sustainable building products, and that's in your list as well. So permanent covers. Now we get in to uh, of just that, a bit more permanence. And you can see we've got pros and cons to everything. Um, take a quick boo at it if you haven't already and put your questions in the chat and we could talk about those. And now we get into shade cloth. And in the in the uh, further um, south uh, areas, um, it becomes extremely important. And uh, I've given you the usual things that shade cloth does for various plants. Remember that old picture or the picture in the earlier slide uh, uh, from Australia, where they constantly had a ten percent. Uh, cover. Um, they grow ginseng in the interior of British Columbia, which is to, which is north of Idaho, and um, it gets hot summers. It's it is our um, orchard country, so we get wonderful peaches and cherries and plums, and all the big fields of ginseng are under shade cloth because the sun's too hot and ginseng doesn't want direct sun. So it really depends what you want. And I've also, uh, uh, you'll notice down the left side, I've got woven number one, woven number two, and woven number three. I've included burlap because it's a natural product. And um, if you have um, a lot of access to burlap, it's a very handy thing to have and you can stitch it all together. Uh, and I used burlap when I was planting carrots because I could I could keep the burlap wet without splashing the ground. And the carrot seed is so fine, I wouldn't have carrot seed all over the place. And I could keep it just damp enough by spraying the burlap. And, it, and it's about 30% shade. So it's very similar to your row cover. And uh, if you um, are near farms, uh, like here in the Fraser Valley, um, you're getting a lot of feed um, and uh, you can get burlap. And often you don't even have to pay for it. So that's something to consider. And up at the top here gives you an idea of what that um, shade cover looks like, how dark it can get. In the 80s and 90s, uh, this is what we use to cover our patios from the afternoon sun for people. And they will they will uh, shade livestock with it. We really want to get away from that sun. And um, to the right of that, you see the different uh, way that it's made. On the left is the knit fabric, and on the right it's woven. And this is a um, American dime. So it shows you relative to the dime how much coverage you get. So enough of that. And here we are, the sunken greenhouse, the really interesting one to me. Uh, the one uh, on the, the upper is kind of the standard one. Your depth will go from um, four to six feet. In other words, now I'm five, five. So uh, from about my waist to my shoulders is about the depth. And uh, I used the one here on the uh, on the right um, because, oh, come on now, don't be like that. Um, on the right, because this this type of house we're all um, familiar with. It's this kind of the split level house. So you have a basement where the windows are right at uh, uh, ground level. And the entrance to this, you can't quite see it, it's in here, um, is a door out to the back. And uh, so the level is actually about three to four feet. And you notice they, they have the windows open. Uh, and so that's very, uh, um, very easy to install without a lot of extra uh, problem. The one on the, uh, this one here is uh, from England. 
and you see this type much more uh, in Europe and uh, in the more northern climates. You notice in here, there's the steps down and um, the gate that opens. And this is the ground level right here. Uh, now the sunken greenhouse, uh, one important thing if you're in the northern climate is that section right there, because let's see if I can bring it up for you. You notice it has a cold sink. And where it says cold sink, that, that piece right in here uh, is where you would actually stand. And uh, you always have this berm to keep things warm. And then you're the self-facing window. So you can see how knowing your sun pattern becomes extremely important. So I've given you some maintenance checklists, uh, whether it is a full on greenhouse or um, a temporary structure, um, it's um, important. And um, particularly here, I really liked this one on the right, um, how to really clean things out and uh, keep the debris from uh, gathering up and keeping the disease down. Even in a simple cold frame, you can get bugs. Bugs love corners. And uh, on my raised beds every spring, I'd have a great infestation of pill bugs. Those are the little funny fellows that that um, look like an armadillo. And they're great, they're composters. And because I always had mulch on my gardens, I got lost lots of composters in the spring, but they tend to eat anything that is around and they would sometimes nibble right at the ground level on my seedlings. So I lined my raised beds with a bit of plastic and guess what they like <clears throat> the warm uh behind the plastic better so they don't migrate to the outside and that was fine it worked just very well <coughs> the other important thing is after you clean something to let it rest uh that's very important whether you're just washing something down um, with safer soap, um, which is non-toxic, you'll still kill things and you need to let it rest. Just like the compost, you know, you it can't be green, you need to let it rest. Now, this is a real, a real favorite of mine because we often think that if we're gonna have plants, um, we go out to them or we have the, the little spider plant hanging in the corner. Um, you all saw the picture of Richard there. Um, I swear I'm going to have to rescue him one day because the, the plants um, turn on him and they'll have him, they'll have him like captured in, in one of his big giant um, uh, vines, you know, um, but anyway, so um, the more you think of, living among plants rather than living next to them, the saner your life seems to get. It's kind of like living with a cat. Um, tremendously entertaining, but you have to understand that you are really um, the second or third most important thing in their life. And of course, studies show that the more you can have plants around you, um, the more... Um, your mental health increases. So we have plants and people together. Oh, there we go. It keeps doing that, the silly thing. And this of course um, is just one of my weird graphics. So we have multi-use covered spaces and uh, it was fun collecting this group. I love the one in the upper left because it really shows you what, here it is outside in winter. There's your 
your snow out there. And that, as you can see from the height of the table, is probably just about armpit height. And it's stone. It's warm. Uh, when you expand this, you'll see there's a little uh, uh, in this corner in here where you can't see anything back in there um, is um, a small stove. And these are um, all tender plants, all the sun um, in winter. So if you have SAD, something like this can really make a difference. Here is um, a wonderful uh, tropical cabinet. So perhaps this is a, a, an urban apartment. And yet here is a wonderful cabinet. And if like me, you have cats, um, that's a really interesting way to do it because the cats can't get at it. Uh, up in the upper right, um, is a geodesic dome and uh, one and the entrance is actually back in there. Uh, uh, it's a little foreshortened. And so here are the chairs um, around the, the pool and the house is in that direction. It's attached to the geodesic dome and look at the water, uh, just beautiful. This one in the lower left is really fun because this is the Yukon and it is winter. And there she is in her tropicals. These windows right here um, uh, are uh, getting snow reflection. And back here is the warmth of the house. And up here is actually, um, they have cover it can all be pulled back. So this is uh, actually a fairly passive system. Here we have um, uh, next to it, um, it's a kitchen and this is the greenhouse. They've just created a window, insulated it and built, built it in and um, they're growing all their salad and their herbs right there in the kitchen. And we don't think of it, but this little guy right here is its own little greenhouse. And you can buy it at, at Ikea. And look, here is a tender, small rosemary. And here are some decorative plants. This is one you see a lot of um, in the Northwest here because of the rain. And it's a sun sunroom. It can get quite hot. So um, uh, many people will have um, a roller shade that goes here and here uh, in summer. But you can see inside, it's got plants and people and um, they um, are living quite happily together. This one I really like, this guy right here. This was an ugly old urban, uh, somewhere in the on the Eastern seaboard, um, in the US uh, was a tiny, ugly little yard. And what they did was that they created a lot of cover. This is a hidden pergola in here. And they grew vines and everything and covered the majority of the yard. And then in winter, they simply pulled the cloth over top. Remember that permanent structures and temporary coverings. So this now uh, living room um, never got never got wet. So that's uh, uh, the imagination um, just takes right off and you can create many, many things. The, the trick is to know your limits. And um, for instance, with your wallapini, um, you have to know your sun window, um, but you also have to know where your underground services are. Um, you also have to know in on um, these greenhouses, um, if they're up against the house, um, can the house exterior handle that moisture or do you have to create a barrier? Um, also know how deep your water table is, particularly with wallapinis. Um, if your ground gets wet, your walls can collapse. 
And so you'll notice in that, I don't know if I can take you back to there or not. There we go. In the, in the wall of painting here, um, you'll see these concrete bricks and they, they, um, they're like cinder blocks. So they have um, air circulation. And here they have a water barrel that uh, is not only a heat sink, but a water source. So think through your plan when you decide what type of cover you want and then step back from it. When I decided to do my greenhouse, I realized that my best choice was to cover our patio, uh, which we did with beautiful post and beam and with the uh, corrugated clear plastic roof, we could watch the stars at night. And I had um, clematis growing up, which created one wall, which I needed shade uh, during that time. And on another wall where there was a lot of wind in winter, it was open in summer and my husband built me um, a piece of fence that we hung between two of the beams and it simply blocked the wind for winter. And I had those lovely little upright greenhouses that I, that I spoke of and had all the seedlings that we wanted and it was completely undercover. It wasn't my idea, but I let the environment tell me what would work. And we really, really enjoyed that. So what have we got next? There we go. Good reads. Again, the Winter Harvest Handbook. Just absolutely wonderful. Um, now this one, there are, oh, didn't do that. Try again, Joe. This guy here, Okay, Black and Decker, it's very, very good. They're actually, this Quarto group from Cool Springs, Tennessee, is actually well known for their how-to books on building things. Um, and um, very easy uh, to, to find. Um, there's one, another one here. Um, this is it. You'll find another real sleeper of a book for how to's from ortho, you know, the people that make all the nasty uh, garden chemicals. Yep. Them great books on how to, and that uh, gives you both of these books, give you some very practical designs for creating everything from um, cold frames to full on greenhouses. And, um, the others um, are ones that I have read um, and prefer over many others. This last one here, this year round um, edible, uh, edible gardening um, by Israelison. She actually published first in Sweden and um, this is her uh, American edition and very, very good. And I'm sure you can find many more um, because uh, it is a big, complex subject. Um, it was a real challenge for me to, uh, um, to winnow down the choices. And here are um, some valuable websites. Again, how to calculate your sun window, and you just put in your longitude and latitude or your city, and it will help you calculate um, where the sun is gonna be. Um, the greenhouse maintenance, that's where I took the um, text from. This is the one on the retractable coop house, which was um, uh, different from the usual, how to build a cold frame. Um, and then something on growing succulents um, because they're a very different plant. And um, if you, like me, are passionate about succulents, um, it's quite a fascinating group to grow. Now this I included, it's something that I used um, for several years. You can buy them, um, uh, I think at Home Depot, as a matter of fact, and they're simply brackets. And they have, uh, if you go to their website, 
Um, they have DIY kits. Um, and um, I would put the two by fours in the brackets. I made a beautiful uh, hipped uh, greenhouse and I would move it from one bed to another. And that was my way of rotating my tomato crop. <laughs> I just moved the greenhouse. And then in winter, I'd take off the cover. I'd pull all the, the uh, wood out of the brackets. I would stack it at the back of the garden shed. It took up very little room. Um, here's some interesting information on sunken uh, greenhouses. Um, and this one um, is where I got the image from growing a bog in a pot. Um, because some bogs are semi-tropical. And um, if you like bog, plant, bog plants or uh, ponds and you want uh, to protect them, uh, like here, ponds, particularly if you keep fish, they're nothing but raccoon feeding stations. So uh, if you don't keep them undercover, the herons and the raccoons will eat all your fish and then um, start nibbling on the plants. So um, some ideas there. Um, how are we doing for time? We're actually, we've actually got uh, some time for questions. Um, so let's shut this down. So there is a few questions for you, Joe. Uh, Good. One in particular, uh, Judy McKinley, would you please elaborate on ambitious, please? <laughs> the reason I say that ambition is that one of the, the deadliest things in a garden is um, I'm a type A. Um, I can do anything. <laughs> and then and then reality reality gets in the way. So yes, have big plans. Put your plans on paper and dream big, but then look at your landscape and it will tell you what you can accomplish. And if you have big dreams, make a three or five year plan because I have seen it time and time again. People have wonderful ideas and they wear themselves out or life changes and everything ends up half done. So just like planning a garden, don't do it all at once. Do one corner. If you're going to start gardening undercover, do a small project until you are very comfortable with it and then incorporate it into a larger project. Okay, we have another question here. Is it too late to do winter sowing outside in a covered container here in the Comox Valley? Vancouver Island, the West Coast Sea tables have info on starting indoors, but it seems like a different environment to the outside container. That's a very good question. Um, the first part, no, it is not too late. It is the perfect time. Uh, do not use your outdoor soil. Um, use a proper potting mix. Uh, because you will keep down all the pathogens that are natural in our soil and are just fine, except not when you want to start seeding seedlings. So no, it is not too late in the Comox Valley. Um, and just make sure that they don't get drowned. Uh, put them under some sort of protection from the rain. Joe, so, yeah. if somebody yes. was like, cool, winter sowing, I want to do that. What would you plant? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's quite fun because the picture that I showed you came from Wisconsin. And um, I have I uh, saw other pictures that um, were completely covered in snow and they were very happy. I used the um, those big clamshells that because uh, I buy the organic spinach and uh, they're perfect. They're a perfect shape. And then they have the lid and they have the drainage. And then in spring, um, when, I, when I've got the seedlings going, um, I empty the container and I flip it over so they're on the lid and they have their own little hoop house on top to keep them, to keep them warm. So, so it, no, it works, no more it works very plastic well. more plastic in your houses anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what, what kind of um, 
plants would you suggest somebody wanting to experiment with this? With, with winter sowing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you want to eat in spring? So that's what you simple sow. Simple as that. Simple as that. What do you want to grow in spring? Um, do you want to start your nasturtiums? Do you want to start your marigolds? Um, maybe you have a shade garden and you want to do impatience. Maybe you want to start uh, growing some perennials that are very uh, perennials and, sh and um, uh, woody shrubs um, are often very slow to germinate because they live longer. So they want to be sure they have a good environment to get started and they can take 21 days to germinate. Well, about, if you put them in the ground at the wrong time, they just rot. But if you let the plant make its own choices, what it about will start veggies? when it when it's when it needs to start. What about veggies, Joe? Um, veggies, I did. Um, uh, let me see, because I I gardened all year round. I did the I did the veggies that would go dormant. Um, and um, would have an early start. So um, my Asian greens, my lettuces, uh, not my garlic. I, I would do my leeks so I could put them in the ground. I'm thinking what else I did. I was too early for squash. I didn't do squash. Um, I, didn't, I did some of my um, uh, herbs like dill that is an early uh, uh an early grower um and didn't do carrots because they don't transplant you can transplant them but they're, they're not happy i did chard because chard uh here gets leaf miner and i could protect it the whole time so i would when I transplanted out my chard, once it started to grow, um, I put them under individual um, containers. Um, yeah, so they each had their own cover and they could um, be excluded from um, the spinach leaf uh, miner. So we have also a question did, here from mm -hmm. Jan. What percentage of ventilation for a greenhouse? Oh, well, that's a very good question and a tricky one. Um, depends on the size. Anything you cover needs to have ventilation. So if you go into greenhouse plants, whether it's do it yourself or you're buying them, they will all present to you the proper percentage of windows and whatnot. I will mention there is a product you can get, which is quite wonderful. It was originally um, invented in England and you see them now uh, with a lot of greenhouses, large and small, um, and they are self-opening windows. It's, um, uh, it, it's a, a cylinder that's filled with oil that's responsive to um, temperature. And so it uh, becomes more viscous and uh, more liquid and then harder, and it will automatically open and close the windows according to the amount of temperature. Um, and so you will always have correct ventilation. The important thing with ventilation is you have it down low and up high. So, okay, we... so you don't really need it in the middle. You need it, to, and people will put it up in the eaves at the ends, um, and you saw that one picture where the windows were opened right on ground level, and that was allowing the cool to come in and the uh, warm to go out. Any solutions for fungus gnats when growing veggies under LED inside over winter? Wow. Um, I know what I do is I use the sticky tapes and just hang them. They seem to be attracted to the yellow. So you'll get the fungus gnats on them. Mm -hmm. One of those uh, fly tapes. Yes. You can get the squares too as well, can't yeah. you? Because I know that you can spray for them. Um, uh, and that Safers does have some effect. But it's, it's hard on the plants. 
and if you can catch the little blighters, um, as you say, Richard, that often seems the best. But if you're getting an infestation on um, a plant, the first thing you do is isolate it. And, or you'll have it on all your plants. So if you have a small greenhouse um, or a small uh, cold frame style greenhouse, um, make sure nobody comes and goes, that they stay in that environment. We have a question here from Anonymous. Uh, when is winter sowing supposed to happen? Now. <laughs> And uh, is now the perfect time? How about earlier in the season in the Pacific Northwest? No, now is the best time in the Northwest. You want to do it. You see the. Um, you want to do it while your soil is still um, a wee bit warm. So look out um, uh, in. Um, I keep forgetting. Now is not November. Now is February. Um, winter sowing, you're not going to be doing winter sowing. You're going to be doing winter sowing in the Pacific Northwest in October and November. Remember in the Northwest or any rainy climate, your soil is colder in April than it is in November. So October, November is the time to do it. If your ground freezes to a foot or more, which you're going to get um, in a more continental um, environment, um, then you need to do your winter sowing before, just just before that first freeze. Further to that, when do you transplant them out? Whenever they tell you to. <laughs> I know that sounds facetious, but you know when a plant wants to be transplanted. What if it and, um, that's when you transplant? If your ground is still frozen, then pot it up just the way we do with tomatoes. Let it get bigger until the outdoor world can accept it. Uh, about a castor bean plant, very toxic, very exotic looking. It's an annual in Kelowna. Would it be perennial on the uh, Nanaimo? No. No, it is just a, it's just an annual, isn't it? The castor yeah. bean. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. How about you, Jean? Is there, are there any more questions? Um, no, I think Richard's got them all. Oh, okay. Well, um, then I guess we're done a wee bit early. Um, I hope I've given you um, enough information to help you make uh, gardening undercover, um, part of the enjoyment of our good green earth. Um, and uh, thank you very much.